Hello everyone, thanks for joining us in this Delphi Com presentation. We're celebrating the 28th anniversary of Delphi. Congratulations to all developers around the world. I am Carlos Agnes and Embarcadero MVP, but more than everything, I am a Delphi lover for a long, long time. Our presentation is about some experiences. I lived across more than 10 years as a Delphi consultant. And the short story here is that some little mistakes in Delphi code are more uh, common than we can imagine. I started to take notes about these mistakes and I started also to summarize them in several presentations like the one that we are going to show now. Uh, all of them were well received by the community, but it is necessary to point out, I know that I'm not the truth owner. Uh, if you consider that I'm wrong in some of the subject that I'm going to show here, it is okay. You can talk to me or if you want to. You can reach me through my email, that is uh, carlos.agnes at tmrti.com.br. Uh, for this presentation, I brought a short list of these common mistakes. Uh, let's go with the first one. Uh, let's talk about the if-then function. Now, we can find in Delphi two of these uh, functions. One is, uh, let me remember, on the math unit. Another one is uh, about strings, uh, str utils. Uh, it is a very useful function. I use it a lot. But some developers forget that if then is not necessarily a ternary operator, at least not a real one. Uh, it means that if then is not resolved at compiler level, but as a function, as a, a normal library. Uh, the result here is that regardless if the Boolean expression that will be used as first, or first parameter, if the, whether the, the parameter is true or not, uh, both the second and the third parameter needs to be evaluated before returning one of another. Uh, so the common mistake here is that some developers provide one or even worse two parameters that are, uh, let's say, complex to evaluate. And let's, let's make an example here, uh, an extrapolated example. Uh, if the function one need, uh, needs, for example, one second to be evaluated, and the second function needs another two seconds, this whole expression here will need three seconds at least of processing, regardless if the first or the second value will be used as the result of the function. So, to use if then, uh, it is important that both and the third parameter, let's say, they should be constants, or maybe, just maybe, very, very low cost functions. Uh, for all the other cases, your solution relies on your good and old friend if expression. Okay? Let's talk about the short circuit evaluation. It is a subject that is very close to the first one. Uh, the premise here is that some developers believe that if you need to, to test some value, and uh, let's use this sample here. Uh, you need to test this value. So after the then ex, uh, expression here or, or then clause, it is safe to continue using the object that uh, needs to be here. For example, uh, this is not necessarily true, let's say. Uh, for example, this code can be considered a bad practice in order, um, for example, it causes more uh, complexity uh, regarding the number of indentation that it needs to cause. And this is a problem. Uh, I don't know if everyone is familiar with the short circuit evaluation, so let's remember, let's remember some basics uh, about Boolean logic. False and anything else will always be false. You don't need to check what, can, what comes after the end operator. False and anything will always be false. Okay. The same is true uh, when you evaluate, for example, true or anything else, the result will always be true. Okay, again, this is the basics, but the case here is that by default, the DeFi compiler also relies on this premise. If one Boolean value is enough to determine the whole expression result, the compiler didn't don't finish the, the, the evaluation. 
so you can, for example, uh, simplify the previous code with uh, this one. Uh, it is safe to test uh, the second uh, expression here this way because uh, if the first expression here fails, the second one will not be tested. That's happened because of the short circuit evaluation. The first expression here, if returning false, is enough to determine the whole expression of the whole if expression, of course. And remember that I told you that uh, this is the default behavior of the compiler, but it can be changed using this property on the options of compiling uh, the, of the, 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 the project itself. But please never, never turn on this property. It can cause lots of breaks in your code or in your uh, compilation, for example. Okay, uh, let's say, let's go to the third case. It is a very, very common case. Uh, I will now go, for example, uh, into the merits of using or not typecasting. I will just assume that it, the cast is needed in this case. And considering uh, if you want to test if some object can be used as a, as a more specific type, it is common to use the is operator. And until now, everything is right, everything is okay. The problem is that after you enter the then clause, uh, you use another as operator. Uh, normally, it happens because the, developers is, the developer is not aware that both the is and as uh, are not simple, not just two simple operators, let's say that way, uh, they demand uh, some, comp some processing. And we are repeating this processing when we call the is and the s. So the best solution here is you have to test if the object is uh, from a more specific type. Okay, this is the case where you need to use the is. But after passing this if condition, it is safe to use the hard type uh, casting like this one. Uh, this kind of type casting just say to the compiler, okay, you can use this, ob this object this way. And uh, the compiler doesn't call any testing solution like the S uh, uses this sample right here. Okay. Now we reach it, uh, let's say our repercussion champion from the previous presentation. Uh, that is the relationship between create an object with a try finally and then call the free inside of the finally block. Let's analyze the first scenario here. Uh, the object is being created inside the try finally block. Of course, it means that in any case, the finally block will always be executed. But what happens if the create process raises an exception? The program cursor will be redirected before assigning any value to the variable that was supposed to store uh, the new object. Uh, so in the final block, a free will be, call will be called on a var that we don't necessarily know what is inside of this var. One of the results of this scenario is that we can receive an access violation or an invalid pointer operation. Uh, the second case here is for example, wishing to reduce code, the developer decided to create two objects and then protect the resources with just one try finally block. This is wrong because if the second object creation raises an exception, the first one, the first object is still unprotected. And the reference to this first object will be lost by the end of the context and it will probably cause a memory leak. Remember, the right way to create uh, uh, an object and protect the resource with a try finally is to create the object and immediately calls the try block, initiate the, the try block, okay? If you need to create two objects, the best solution is to protect them with two try finally blocks, one for each creation like this sample here. But remember that I told you about the complexity of the code regarding the indentation. If it is important to you to keep a low indentation level, you can always initiate the verse with new and then initiate the try finally block. 
Normally, this is the case where the developers uh, start to interact with me on the previous presentation, telling me that this code will raise an exception because of the possibility of a free being called by a new reference. This is not true. The free is by design programmed to test if the reference is different from new. And then, only then, in this case, the object destructor will be called. Finally, I will finish this presentation saying that lots of the common mistakes that I used to see around, there's a warning or a hint by the compiler showing to the developer uh, the point that could be better or even worse is causing a bug. And the developer didn't see it because it just one more warning among thousands of the, the warnings that the project has. This is not a good thing. So, I am a fan and always recommend the zero warnings and hints policy. Believe me, uh, soon then you can realize it will save you precious time to keep this policy in your projects. This is it about our today's presentation. If you already saw some mistakes like this and like to share them with me, please feel free to contact me. Uh, if you used to write code like the ones I've shown here, don't worry, some of them I was victim myself and I had to learn them in the worst possible way. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, this section, and see you around. Again, happy anniversary Delphi. Bye bye everyone. <laughs>